All right. So today we're going to talk about one of the powerful moments in the Bible. I think we're going to spend the summer talking about some of the great moments in the scripture. Okay. And so I'm going to start us off with when Moses brought everybody across the Red Sea. Okay. So do you want me to read this story to you or do you know the story? Okay. There's always some little nuance that you didn't see before. Yes. Remember when we were quoting Lewis's, Lewis's Bible last week, right? Anywhere, everywhere, however, whatever that was, I said. And then I came and asked him what verse it was, and he said, it's the book of Lewis. <laughs> okay. So, uh, beware of the man who writes a chapter of the Bible, okay? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's in Revelations. All right, so the Pharaoh is going to say to the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. He goes, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them and I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed towards the people. And they said, what is this we have done that we have let go Israel from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his army with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all of the chariots of Egypt with officers all over them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them. All Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen and his army overtook them encamped at the sea by Pi Hathroth in front of Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians that you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only have to be silent. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea. Divide it that the people of Israel may go through the land, go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the heart of the Egyptians, and they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host, and his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Well, the Egyptians pursued and went in after them, into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen. And in the morning, watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and on the cloud, look down on the Egyptian forces, threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so they, when they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians." Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots and their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand, 
and the sea returned to its normal course, and the Egyptians were thrown into the midst of the sea, and all of them took a bath. That was Lewis's version of the end of. Um. So the Israelites saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, and they feared the Lord and they believed the Lord. And they sang the songs. Yes, they did. So, this is a powerful moment. Do you know that the Romans referred back to this moment when the Israelites walked through the Red Sea, okay? This was a big deal for them. Uh, the Romans, which would have been in Jesus' time, were referring back, you know, 1,500 years to this moment. Everybody understood that this was a radical event. And, and you know, we teach it in Sunday school. This one nine-year-old boy, he came home, and his mom said, what did they teach you in Sunday school today? And he said, well... He, they taught us that Moses went behind enemy lines to do a rescue mission for the Israelites while they were in Egypt, okay? And um, Moses had his engineers build pontoon floats so that the Israelites could cross over. And then once they crossed over, the Israeli army swooped down in their jets and, you know, shot down all the Egyptians. The mom was horrified. They taught you that in Sunday school? He said, no, but if I told you what they taught us, you'd never believe it, Okay. <laughs> And so here we have the Israelites. They've been in, in bondage for hundreds of years. We don't know how many years, but they, we know they were there 430 years. And once Joshua died, um, Joseph. yep, thank you, Joseph died. Uh, guess what? Um, we don't know how long they were in, but it might have been hundreds of years. It could have been, you know, almost 400 years. And, and so now God comes to Moses, shows up in a burning bush, and says, I want you to let my people go free. I want you to see something here. God sees us in our bondage, and he steps in on our behalf. The Israelites weren't even asking for God to step in, and God stepped in. How much more so when you and I are in our situations, will he step in, whatever your situation might be? And, and, you know, what had happened, the ten plagues occurred, and the Egyptians said, please leave, because everybody's firstborn died. And so they gave them a bunch of gifts of gold, whatever was wealthy. They handed it to the Israelites, please leave us. And after a few days, they changed their minds. And, and it says that God was going to harden Pharaoh's heart. And this has always been held against God. How could God take somebody and harden their heart? How could you hold Pharaoh accountable when God moved on his heart. Well, when you go through the scriptures, you see that the first situation where God spoke to Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardened his heart. First time out, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And from there on, God took that hardened heart and used it for his advantage. What do I mean? A hardened heart would normally just go, oh, well, I mean, I got too many calamities here. I'm just going to close up shop and let these Israelites go. And God wanted to communicate to the Israelites of his care. He wanted to show the Egyptians that he was the real God. Uh, God had a plan in hardening Pharaoh's heart. And so I think when they realized they just lost their free labor, the Egyptians did, um, you know, they decided, let's go get them back. And, and the Israelites have a dilemma. They have the Red Sea in front of them. They have the Egyptian army behind them. They're actually in a canyon with walls, high walls on either side. Have you ever been between a rock and a hard place? Have you ever been pinned down with nowhere to go, no way out? Guess what? This is where the Israelites are. And, and, you know, when you become a Christian, you think, well, this is the end of all my problems because I now have the Lord God working for me. And in some ways, yes, this is the end of your sinful ramifications. God has removed the domination of sin from your life. He has removed the consequences of sin from your life. 
you now go to heaven and you now can call on him to interact in your life. However, you have a new enemy, Satan, who wants to throw marbles under your feet and get you to fall on your spiritual journey. Okay? Very important that you hear this. Um, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay? When you have God as your source, he's going to get you through all of these problems. Jesus says, in this world you do have tribulations. I have overcome the world. And he's placed you under his covering. And, and here we have the cosmic spiritual battle. God bringing salvation, deliverance, and the wicked taskmaster of sin holding us in chains of bondage, bitterness, and burdens. And, and something I want you to hear is God has a plan for your life. We all love that passage, Jeremiah 29, 11. He has a future and a hope. When you're in a situation, you need to remember, well, God's got a plan for me. All right? Very important that you remember that. Your life has a plan attached to it, and you need to rest in this awareness. Okay? Um, what is about this problem? God is going to use the problem to reveal himself. Maybe God's going to move in your situation that you would consider a problem, and it's really a faith opportunity, a spiritual moment. I want you to reframe things. I mean, God's going to do something supernatural, but these guys are going to have to step forward. All right? The sea's going to roll back. And, and, and I would imagine when Moses calls, caused the sea to go back, they were wondering, well, is the ground going to be hard enough? Are we going to sink into the mud? Are the walls of water going to stay back long enough? Are the Egyptians going to be able to come through and still get us anyways? I mean, when you're in a problem, don't we usually freeze and our mind just works all these negative potential situations. And what you and I have to do is step forward anyways. Very important that you hear this. Step forward anyways. You know, this one guy was thinking about marrying this woman and he didn't know what to do. He said to his friend, I can't decide whether to, to marry her or not. And his friend said, well, why don't you put down a list of the pros and cons and then make your decision? So he sees his friend about a, two weeks later. He goes, hey, what did you decide? He goes, well, I did the pros and the cons, and I decided to marry her anyways. Okay. <laughs> so um, what about with God, his character traits, his nature, his love for you? We have a God that we can trust, that we can believe in, that we can lean on. All right? Um, I like the way that God came looking for them when they were enslaved, the way God used 10 miracles to free them, the way God now, you know, is, is a pillar of fire and cloud to guide them. God who is the one who parts the Red Sea. And, and what are your choices? The choices for the Israelites are stay there, get enslaved and slaughtered, or to step forward with God. And really, sometimes you and I have the same situation. We can stay in our situation, our challenging moments, our disappointing you know, circumstances, or we can decide to trust God, step out, and see where he's going to lead us. Sadly, we prefer a known bondage over an unknown freedom. And to be a Christian is to say, okay, God, what's the next chapter that you have for me? Well, usually we don't move forward because we're afraid. Um, and, and often whether, you know, you have a bad behavior pattern, a bad state of mind, a bad attitude, you won't forgive somebody, okay? Um, these things can become a place that stops you from going forward with God. And, and so only you know in your heart what you have to hand over. And we don't want to hand it over. But once we do, God becomes all the more miraculous in our lives. And, and I think sometimes in our problems, we always focus on what I can do, and we forget about what God can do. And that's why we're going to spend the summer talking about the miraculous hand of God to consider what God can do. You know, if you heard my sermon on Sunday, there was all kinds of miraculous moments in my journey, and every single one of them had a Bible verse pinned to it to remind you that what I was doing was merely in the Bible, was merely what God said is available to us.
Okay, it wasn't like, ooh, some supernatural fun stuff is going on. No, it's just what happened in the Bible, and that's what God is still doing today right now. And, and so God usually does things in a way that causes us to trust him, to have faith. Um, God says to Abraham, go to a land that I'm going to show you. So think about that. Yeah, that goes somewhere. You don't even know where you're going. And, and many of us, you know, we'd say, well, okay, let me see the map. Let me know the plan. Give me the facts. I, I need to, you know, gather all the information before I can commit. And that's just not the way God operates in our lives, okay? Um, remember the ten lepers. As they went forward on Jesus' word is when they got healed. As we go forward in our relationship with God, that's when we see the miraculous. And, and the thing you need to know is, is a lot of times... Our spiritual journey is not a straight line. It's a bunch of detours. I like to call it plan B. Okay? We have a plan and our own mistakes or somebody else's mistakes, our own sins, somebody else's sins thrust upon us. We end up on plan B and we find God waiting there for us. He's a beautiful, graceful, merciful God. And you need to know something. Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Now, the line from Egypt to Canaan is about 10 days to two weeks. All right. They were just 10 days away from the promised land. But God took them the scenic route. <laughs> Why? Because God, God has a plan that they don't know about. He knew something that they were unaware of. He knew that the Egyptians are going to come looking for him. Okay? That the Egyptians are going to change their mind. And so God sets this up to show all Egypt. Okay, guess what? I am the man, the myth, the legend. And... He wants Israel, more importantly, to find out something, that I really am your God, and I really care for you, and I can get you through any situation, okay? Um, you know, sometimes God knows things we don't know. I remember one time I was on the beach in Mission Beach, San Diego, and I met this girl, and she was beautiful. Hello, come on in. And I thought, oh, Lord, I was single. Is this the one? And I heard an audible voice. No. So I dated her anyways. Okay. Um, I don't know. It says that God did not give them the land right away because they were going to encounter warriors. And these guys are just coming out of slavery. They have no concept of weapons. God says, I didn't give you the promised land too early because there's animals. The wild animals are too many. And you go, wild animals? Do you remember in the 1800s when they were building the railroad through India, the two lions killed, I don't remember how many people. I mean, it was a big problem. They got two stuffed lions in the, the museum in Chicago because it was such a big deal, you know, in the last century. Such a humongous, you know... Just two lions. So imagine lots of wild animals, okay? God, God is protecting them. And, and sometimes we're wondering, well, God, why is it taking you so long to, to answer this prayer and show up and do what I want you to do? Well, maybe God wants to teach us something about the journey. You know, if we bypass the destination, the journey to our destination, um, we don't grow. It's on the destination that we experience God. We create the relationship. We find out who he is. And I got some bad news for you. The Lord is more interested in your inner growth than he is in your physical blessings. He's more concerned about what's going on between you and him than he is about, you know, you having a good life. He wants you to learn how to depend on him. And this, those times in the desert, those times up against the Red Sea where we find God like we never did before. And God knows what we can handle, and he knows what we can't. Remember, when I was in seminary, we'd come out, and you had two options. Option A, you could have um, an associate pastor position. 
Option B, you could be a solo pastor. And, you know, a lot of people did the smart thing. They went the associate pastor route, took on a small amount of responsibility and, you know, learned under somebody good and then stepped up to another role. And then there's the the thick headed guys like me. And we want to do it right now. And we take the solo pastor and usually a solo pastor is in some podunk town that's either in, in the inner city or in, you know, the country, <laughs> okay? And um, then what difficult circumstances it is to be a pastor in one of those two situations. But you have to learn how to preach every week. You have to figure out how to do a Sunday school. You have to be the youth leader. You have to be, also be the custodian, okay? I mean, there's all kinds of things you have to do when you're a solo pastor that, you know, you thought you were going to come in and teach and preach, you know, and it's just completely opposite, you know. You got to roll up your sleeve. And by the way, you get to preach and teach too. So you, sometimes we, we misunderstand God. Kind of reminds me of the uh, gentleman who was in the circus and his, his job was scooping up after the elephants. And somebody said, man, maybe you ought to get another job. And he said, what, you mean quit show business? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know how that ties into what I'm saying, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> so here's God. And how many of us know this situation where we're hemmed in, we're pinned down, there's no way out? And believe it or not, God has you right where he wants you. Amen. Okay? Uh, God put them in this situation. Didn't we say we we're going to die? We're better to die in Egypt and to be enslaved forever than to, to be in an a, a, a insecure situation like this? And, and you and I have to look at our present situations and decide, how am I going to face it, with fear or with faith? The Israelites, oh, we knew we shouldn't have left Egypt. You know, and Moses says, stand back and see the hand of God. Okay, one of my favorite statements in the Bible. All right? Uh, Moses brings words of faith. And, and a lot of times you'll be in a situation where you have words of reason and words of faith. And the, the scary thing about words of reason is they make sense. It's what a natural uh, decision would be. But we don't live according to the natural. We live according to the supernatural. And that's when we lean on God and he says, I want you to step away from this situation because I have something better for you. I want you to tend to this, this job. I, I, he's got a plan for your life. Remember, he's got a plan for your life. It's so important that you hear this. And, and fear not. It's, it's been stated that fear not occurs 366 times in the Bible. That's one for the leap year, too. <laughs> Okay? And it's the same thing that, that the angel said to Mary when she learned she was with child from the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing Jesus said to the disciples when they were in the boat in the fierce storm. It's the same thing the angel said to Mary Magdalene when she went to Jesus' tomb after he died on the cross. It's the same thing he says to you and me. Fear not. Don't you know that I'm your God? That your circumstances are, 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 are under my control. Um, somebody's facing a fearful situation and they, they texted me. They're like, oh, man, I, I, I'm seeing this blonde figure in my dreams and it's just frightening me to death. And, and, you know, and I'm thinking, well, it sounds like an angel to me. But you need to know something. Um, like every now and then my wife will encounter... The demonic, demons, okay? And my, you know, if it was me, I'd be like, oh no. And she's just like, uh, you guys. And just passes them by like it's nothing. Because for her, she knows who she belongs to. She knows what agenda she's under. She knows that God is her, her Lord and Savior. And so she brushes them aside. If they show up in a dream or if they wake her up at night, she just turns over the other way and just, continues to have confidence in God. And friends, that's what you and I are supposed to do. That's how you and I are supposed to live. Confidence in God. And it doesn't matter what situation. It could be demonic. It could be, you know, a, a negative work environment. It could be a difficult family situation. It could be an awkward health. It doesn't matter. Because you have what? 
an agenda. I, God has a plan for your life, and he loves you. Remember, he went and sought these guys out to save them. How much more will he save those who belong to him? And, and fear is when we can't see God through the circumstances. Faith is when we, can't, when we see our circumstances through God. We need to see all of our circumstances from the Lord's perspective. And, and you know, you can be troubled on all sides. Remember Paul says we're troubled on all sides, and, but we're not perplexed. Here's the Israelites. If you look left, there's the wall, canyon wall. Right, the canyon wall. Forward, the Red Sea. Backwards, you got the Egyptian army. There's nowhere to look, right? Except up. When there's nowhere else to look, look up. In fact, if you walk with the Lord long enough, you figure out that's the first look. Oh, I got a problem? Boom. You look up and say, God, um, actually, I don't have a problem, Lord. We have a problem. Did you notice that I read, God will fight for you? He takes your problem and makes it his problem. And that's not a bad team member. When Almighty God is the one who's now going to pick up your problem, your situation, and fight for you. Okay? Well, he delights in saving us. And again, my favorite, one of my favorite statements, stand back and see the salvation of God. You know, that's when God does his best work, when we, we have nowhere to turn but to him. And, and there's something that you'll learn in the Hebrew of this passage. The Red Sea does not split until the Israelites move forward. Moses does this, he, but first thing he says is, tell them to go forward. As they move forward, Moses lifts up his arms. The sea splits. Once again, this is faith in action. And I want you to look at your situation, your circumstances, your problem, prayers, whatever they might be. This is how you're supposed to do it. Okay. Now, you have to know something, that there are scholars who believe that this was a misprint in the Bible. It's not the Red Sea, it's the Reed Sea. It wasn't some big ocean that was split, it was the Reed Sea, which actually makes it all the more impressive that the Egyptians drowned in ankle-deep water, okay? However, there are underwater land, there's an underwater land bridge that the sonar shows there's deep water around the entire Red Sea except for right where God led the people to that place. There's a land bridge. Uh, guess what? God knew what he was doing. Okay? Now, I did read an alternative to the biblical account. You see, you might think it's miraculous, but actually what happened was um, a huge volcanic eruption on the Greek island of Santorini back in the 16th century B.C. that was a thousand times more powerful than a nuclear bomb occurred. The ash would have plunged the area into darkness, generating lightning and hail, which was two of the plagues, by the way. The cloud would reduce rainfall, causing a drought, poisoning the, the Nile River, which would then cause it to become red, the first plague. It would have driven out the frogs, the second plague, resulting in a mass of flies, the third plague, okay, and the lice, the fourth plague. This would have been fatal to the cattle, the fifth plague, and boils on humans, the sixth plague, all right? Uh, the Santorini eruption could have triggered a 600-foot tidal wave traveling 400 miles an hour for 100 miles um, long, 60, six foot high, and when it reached the Egyptian delta, the tsunami would have withdrawn the water so that they could cross over. All right? Well, you could believe that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know? um, the coincidence is that the tsunami happened right when the Egyptians and the, were chasing the Israelites across the uh, Red Sea. Okay, that's the coincidence. Um, you know, sometimes it's just easier to believe what the Bible says than to come up with an alternative. 
Now, I've got friends in my life who they work every single angle around what the Bible says. And you know what? Just, hey, while you go struggling against God, I'm just enjoying yet another miracle. <laughs> okay? Uh, more grace, more experiences with God. Okay? More of his goodness. More of his presence. You could fight against them scientifically and philosophically, or you could just go with his, this God of love and experience just how amazing he is. Do you realize that there's never been any archaeological evidence found that disproves the Bible? Kind of important to realize, okay? And, and a lot of people get upset with the God that would drown the Egyptians. What kind of a God is he? Well, if you remember, all Hebrew baby boys were supposed to be drowned in the Nile. And so poetic justice that God is saying, what you did to my children is what you're going to now have to experience. All right. And, and I want to bring something up. <clears throat> God didn't save them from bondage just to drown them in the sea. And I don't think God saved you so that you would then get overwhelmed by your present circumstances. He's available to move. He wants to answer your prayers. He enjoys the camaraderie, the personal friendship that you have with him. He loves to show up. And as I said on Sunday... When you're busy in yourself with his agenda, that's when all the supernatural stuff happens. And some of it's just for you and him to enjoy. Some of it's for you to be used to be a testimony for somebody else. Okay? But it's when we're busy with his agenda that we get to see him move so powerfully. Um, Psalm 106.7 The people provoke God at the sea because they did not remember the multitude of his mercies. Now, just think about this. The cloud moved from the front of the two, three million Israelites to the back, separating the Israelites from the Egyptians. Now, would that not alone have inspired you to think, well, God's on the move? And how many times do we see God on the move and yet we choose to fret and fear and worry? and doubt, and question, and get mad at God. And what a must break his heart. You know, it says in Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And sometimes faith is just believing in what you hope for. It's the conviction of things not seen. And we learned that hope is not just, I'm wishing it's going to happen. It's a certainty that's still coming my way. That's what biblical hope is. So, Anybody here facing rivers that appear uncrossable? Remember what Isaiah 43 says, when you pass through the rivers, I will be with you. Is there somebody here facing a mountain that's too big? Remember, the faith of a mustard seed can move a mountain. Is there an impossible situation that you're facing? Nothing is impossible with God. May the Lord... Repeat Exodus 14 in our lives. Guide us through an impossible situation. A work situation, a health situation, a faith situation, a family situation, a personal situation. May the Lord take us by the hand and lead us through it so that just as God said, I'm going to get glory out of this Red Sea moment. May you get glory from our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. 
click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.